Oh, thank you so much to the organizers for the invitation. So the talk is Moduli of P-Divisible Groups. In a way, it's complementary to the last talk. It concerns more the supercuspidal region of Schmore varieties rather than the ordinary part. Good uh, job on the, uh, <laughs> on the ordering of the talks, I would say. This is with Peter Schultz. And the setup is as follows. So let's say K is a perfect field of characteristic P. P. And uh, let's start with a P divisible group. And I'll call it H naught over K, P divisible group. And we'll be interested in deformation problems related to this H0. How do you deform H0 to an H, let's say, over some local ring of residue field K? So uh, the work of rapoport zinc they study this problem rather intensively. And they consider a certain deformation problem of H0. which they show is representable by a formal scheme over the ring of vit vectors of, of k. So I'm not being perfectly precise here, but. OK, see, I'm, so I'm not being perfectly precise in order to head off questions about what sorts of rings and what category it's on. So yeah, OK, representable by a formal scheme. M. So I'll write Roman M H0 for this formal scheme over the ring of vit vectors. And the next thing to do is to take this formal scheme and pass to the generic fiber to obtain a rigid analytic space. So let me do that. And I'll write with a script M sub H0. So let's pass to the generic fiber. So this is a topologically a finite type. So you get a rather well-behaved rigid space right here. And uh, then what you do is you add level structures to this problem. You consider deformations of H0 equipped with a basis for its p to the n torsion. So let's denote by this. So it's a covering of this rigid space. And they're arranged in a tower. And this is the space you get by adding a p to the m level structure. structure. So uh, again, a rigid space, uh, this covers MH0. And these guys are structured in a tower. Um, this guy individually has an action of the group GLN, Z mod P to the M, Z. And what's the N? N is the height, height of H0. Okay. And the goal here mm, is to is to construct a space hmm, which is going to be the inverse limit of all of these guys at once. So that could only reasonably be called m h 0 infinity. And it should be the inverse limit of these individual spaces. And this, oh, so I want to show that this is, makes sense. It can't possibly make sense as a rigid space. It's just too big. But it does make sense in Peter Schultz's new category of perfectoid spaces. So space. And it even admits a simple, well, simpler description in terms of linear algebra. And that idea is going to be the goal of the talk. Linear algebra. And furthermore, uh, the reason I might be interested in this space is that it admits an action of the group GLN, not ZP, but actually all of QP, this whole group. And the cohomology of this space should realize the local Langlands correspondence for this group. 
And by now, that sort of thing is known by what we know about these individual spaces. I mean, the cohomology here is the direct limit of the cohomologies here. Um, but I should also remark that you can, you can adapt the situation to get Rappaport zinc spaces at infinite level. for other reductive groups, uh, g over qp. OK. All right. Um, very good. So yes, uh, I guess I have two additional remarks. So one is that I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, at the end considering the case of Lubin Tate. Um, so by the Lubin Tate case, I mean the simplest possible H0. So that means that H0 is connected and one dimensional. Uh, let's call its height n once again. Um, I'll remark that this m H0 without any level structure is a disk. Sorry, it's a ball. It's an open ball of dimension n minus 1. n minus 1. And the tower of covers mh0n is, an a, is uh, each one is a tall over the last. Um, so I'll focus. Ah, right, components. OK. So it depends on what your deformation problem is. If it's deformations up to isogeny, then you actually get z copies of this open ball. Actually, that's maybe a better point of view. I like when things are symmetric, and then you actually do get an action of the whole thing. So I, will, I like that comment enough that I will even adapt <laughs> z copies of the open ball. Right, OK. So that's just one example here. All right, good. Um, excellent. Oh, and then, yeah, I guess one thing I'd like to say. So this, this, in order to try to convince you that this can't possibly be anything reasonable like a rigid space, the analogy that I like to think about is uh, another inverse limit. Um, let's take a manifold like S1. So this is a manifold with the structure of a group. And let's take its uh, inverse limit under a map like x goes to x to the p. And these are, this is an etal map from S1 to itself. But the inverse limit is not a manifold. It's, it's this rather awful thing. So. Uh, it's Z, R across ZP modulo Z. <laughs> so um, a neighborhood of a point really, no matter how small a neighborhood it is, doesn't look like anything reasonable. It still has this fractal, na fractal nature to it. And in rather similar vein, you expect this MH0 infinity to have a fractal nature to it. And that's what perfecto spaces look like. They don't have tangent spaces, by the way. OK. Um, good. All right. So. Uh, all right, so I'll just put this over here. That's fine. Say that again? So when you do this uh, uh, limit of, uh, let us say, smooth things with finite et al, mm -hmm. uh, in the limit, do you, th does the tangent bundle make sense? It should be the pullback from the tangent, so it doesn't make sense. Right, so the question is about the tangent bundle at the top of this tower. And it doesn't really make sense. It has to, it has to be 0, if anything. Um, but think of this, I mean, just think of this example. What's the tangent, what's the tangent space to the origin of that, of that space? It, uh, it, it, just, it, it just doesn't look like any su open subset of R around the origin. So it, it, it really can't be a tangent space. Okay. Uh, oh, I want to push this up even further. Well, I think that's OK. All right. So, all right, so we need to first talk about p divisible groups over, yeah, there it goes. <laughs> yeah, that's what I feared would happen, yeah. If I stop in the, I, so I can't ever leave anything in the middle. No, you can leave something in the middle, but if you, if you put it here, <laughs> Oh, I see. Oh, I see. There's some imaginary line. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
All right. All right. So let's uh, have the next section be. Uh, divisible groups over k, where k is still a perfect field and characteristic p. And here the situation is extremely well known. So um, I'll just do this to fix notations. So the category of p divisible groups over k is equivalent to a category of Dudenet modules. And for this talk, the Dudenet modules will be covariant. So um, this is an equivalence, not an anti-equivalence. And uh, on the other side, uh, K modules over UFK. the Giudine part means that they're equipped with an F and a V, and F times V equals P. And it's rather aesthetic that I'm choosing the covariant formulation, but it just makes my life a little bit easier for the rest of the talk. But it produces this, well, maybe you're not used to this kind of thing, but. Uh, here, the constant p-divisible group, uh, its Dudenet module, its f is p, and its v is 1. So p and v equals 1. Uh, maybe the opposite of what it is for the contravariant module. So here it's the opposite. So the multiplicative p-divisible group works the other way. Um, all right, so there's different equivalent formulations of how to construct the Giudine module. So Professor Fontaine has a whole book on the subject. But um, I want to do the point of view of messing in terms of universal vector extensions of a p-divisible group. So, um, so I will construct the Giudine module in terms of universal vector extensions. OK. Uh, the idea is this. So if R is any, uh, yeah. if R is a K algebra, uh, I can just take, and, and H is a P divisible group, I can take H and just evaluate it on R, and I get an abelian group. And what does this mean? So it means, so. H is composed of HNs, which are group schemes over K. I can take any one of them and evaluate them on R, and now I just take the forward limit. OK. OK. So H is going to be a functor from K algebras to abelian groups. Um, so, so, all right, so now I need the hook. So maybe that's close enough. And, right. So the idea is to take H. Mm. I actually wanted to notate, notate by H0 my p divisible group. So it's H. imagine it's H0 in both of those places. So let's lift H0 over k to H over w of k. And then this H fits into an exact sequence like so. Ah, no, I'll just put V here. V for vector. Uh, so this is the universal vector extension like this. And so what are these things? So these are also functors from R algebras to abelian groups. But this one is isomorphic to some number of copies of the additive group. So um, you can consider the category of such extensions, and then the initial object of such a category will be the universal vector extension. And we can just consider this as a black box, but then uh, the, the Dioranet module of H0 is defined to be the Lie algebra of EH. Yes, yes. So that's the black box I'm referring to. So this is m of h0, not m of h. This does not depend on the lift that you chose. So this only depends on, on h0. And in fact, you get a functor from h0 to DNA modules, and this is what the DNA module is, the covariant one. Okay. 
And for all this to work out, the only things that were necessary about k and w of k is that this map between them, w k to k, is a PD thickening. So the kernel has divided powers. So we can actually place this whole discussion in a more general context. And when we do that, we get the notion of the Dunanay crystal. So, OK. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. piatically complete, separated, nilpotent PD thickening. I hope I haven't missed any adjectives. No, not no. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay. Ah, no, no, no. You don't. Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. But, but in the, what I'm next going to say, I'll introduce the crystalline period rings. Okay. Okay. Mm, all right. Yeah, okay. So let's suppose R. Hmm. All right. So what we do now is replace K with a ring R, and R will be a ring in characteristic P. So it's an F FP algebra, which I assume to be not perfect, but semi-perfect. Meaning that the Frobenius map from R to R is surjective. That's what semi-perfect semi means. So, mm, that simplifies the discussion of Dudenay crystals considerably. Because um, you consider the category of PD thickenings, and it has this initial element due to Fontaine. So um, there exists a universal PD thickening. Uh, a crystal of R to R. And then you can copy everything here. If you have a p-divisible group over R, uh, you can lift it to a Chris of R. Consider the universal vector extension. Take the Lie algebra of the center. And then you get the Dudenay module. So I'll just write that as m of h0. And this is a projective module over this ring. With, and it has the F and the V. So that's the more general due to name module. Okay. All right, so um, all right, now I need one of these boards again. So I want this in the middle. Okay. And this here. But yeah, okay. All right. Um, all right, so now we have this functor from p divisible groups to Dudenay modules over the crystalline period ring. Uh, unfortunately, the situation is not as nice as for perfect fields. That functor is not going to be an equivalence of categories in general. But we can ask for something a little less strong, namely, is this functor fully faithful? And so now we have our first theorem. So. So I assume the ring is slightly, it's a slightly stronger condition than M being semi, R being semi-perfect. Uh, so the condition is F semi-perfect. And that means that R is a quotient like so, where S is perfect, perfect ring and characteristic P, and I is a finitely generated ideal. Uh, okay, so such a ring is always semi-perfect uh, because you're, it's a quotient of something perfect, but the quotient is by a finitely generated ideal. And an example of this would be the ring OCP modulo P. So it's a very large ring. Um, this is the quotient of, <laughs> well, now this is known by OCP flat modulo some uniformizing element like P flat, okay. So this is a good example to keep in mind. 
All right. Then the theorem states that the student A module functor is fully faithful. So H0, FH0 is fully faithful. OK. That is, as a functor from P divisible groups over R to Dürer modules over A Chris of R. OK. Um, good. Up to isogenies? Oh, yes, yes. There I really do. Up to isogenies. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, OK. With some stronger conditions, we can get it on the nose. But for, I must say up to isogenies. So that is Hans. From H0 to G0, tensed with QP, this maps onto Hans, which can meet with Frobenius and of H0. G0. So QP. OK. All right. So um, I want to specialize a little bit to the situation where the first P divisible group is constant. And we'll see what the um, consequence is. So, uh, okay. So this will really send to the top. This will bring down. Hmm. Yes. All right. So now the role of the first p divisible group will be played by the constants q p mod z p. So P. And uh, the second one, well, OK, so this will be my H0 base change to R. So yeah, so um, I should have said this before. So let's say H0 is a P divisible group over a perfect field K. And let's say that R is a semi-perfect K algebra. OK. So under those conditions, now we have two p divisible groups. I'm going to consider them over R. The first is the constants, and the second is H0 base change to R. So this, oh, yes, of course, isogenies, yes. Okay. This will be the same as Hans, which can be with Frobenius of M of QP mod ZP m of h0 r tensor qp. Yes? r is f, thank you. r is, I forgot the f. f semi-perfect so that I can apply the theorem. And uh, let's evaluate the left-hand side first. So here, well, 1 over p has to go to a p torsion point. 1 over p squared has to go to a p squared torsion point. So what you get is a tower of p torsion points. So you get an element here of uh, the inverse limit of H0 uh, with torsion in P to the n evaluated at R. And this is still tensored with QP. Okay. And uh, so, th but this is quite the same thing as the inverse limit of just H of R itself. Remember, you can just take. Well, I erased it. But remember, you can just take H and apply it to, to R. It's essentially the, the union of all of the N, P to the N torsion points. And so just if you have a tower like this, well, because R is P torsion, every element is eventually is torsion for some high enough power of P. So everything here lives in here. And then conversely, it's pretty easy to see that every element here lives in here. But then this is a QP vector space. So this is the map from X goes to PX. You can take any abelian group you like and do this to it, and then you get a QP vector space. So of course, it extends from this ZP module to this QP vector space. So this is an isomorphism. And I'm going to give this a name. I'm going to call this functor. When you send R to this guy, evaluated at R, I'll call that H tilde of R. And I will call H tilde the universal cover. Just considered as a functor on k algebras. I forgot the zero. I 
forgot the zero everywhere. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so that's the left side. The right side. So m of qp mod zp, I said, was this. Uh, so uh, the thing is, I want to kind of put the qp inside. So when you, so this is going to be a cris of r tensor with qp. So that's b cris plus plus of r uh, times some basis element, and f acts on this basis element as p. So that's what this part is. Uh, this part. Um, all right, so this arises from base extension from something that lives over k, the perfect field. So DNA modules work well with respect to base change. So this is just m of h0, which is a w of k algebra, tensored over w of k with v plus Chris. OK, well, this is a little misleading. I mean that this tensored with qp is this. And so Homs from this into this, they have to respect Frobenius. So the basis element here has to land somewhere where Frobenius acts as p. And so the whole thing just goes down to uh, m of h0 tensored with b plus Chris. I should really be put the r there. Okay, r. So it lives in the part where phi. So I'm going to write this as phi equals p. But the understanding is that phi acts on the left factor as f and on the right factor as phi. OK. Yeah. So far, so good. Okay. So as an example, when h0 is constant, you recover a familiar result. ZP, well, the universal cover is actually just QP. When you take the inverse limit of this with respect to P, you get QP. And now this is telling us that QP is isomorphic to, all right, so there, uh, the DNA module has Frobenius acting as P. And so divide by P, and you just get Frobenius acting as 1. So, cross of R. P equals 1. Okay. So this is known when R is OCP, and now we know it for more generally. And then for H0 equals uh, mu P infinity, um, so that you get mu P infinity tilde of R, which is sequences of L nil topologically, no, just nil potent elements of R. Um, compatible under piece power maps. Uh, this is the same as b plus Chris of r. Phi equals p, because now the Deuteronay module has f acting as 1. So phi equals p just puts phi equals p there. OK. All right, so these results uh, are maybe not such a huge surprise. So in certain situations, uh, for instance, when r is like OCP mod p, um, isomorphisms like these, and, all, and, and more generally, like even when phi is p to the n, you get a p divisible group of height n here. Uh, so these were investigated by the recent paper of Farag and Fontaine. Uh, as applications to their fundamental curve of Piat de Koch theory. Okay. All right? Okay. All right, so that's my discussion of p divisible groups over rings of characteristic p. I now want to lift the situation to characteristic 0, because in the end, we really want some object which, which classifies p-divisible groups over characteristic 0 rings, because I want something on the generic fiber. I want a rigid space over QP. Okay. So this goes up. Um, I'll bring this now. Oh, I need that. Oh, well, it's OK. OK. So p divisible groups over characteristic zero rings. All right. OK. So once again, k is a perfect field. And uh, the kinds of characteristic zero rings I want to investigate are, um, they fit into pairs like this. Uh, 
R R plus. So this is meant to evoke the notation of attic spaces. So here, R R plus. So R plus, I want to be a P torsion free W of K algebra, which should be P adically complete. And I want uh, R plus mod P to be F semi-perfect. To be F semi-perfect, which is, by the way, the situation you get when this is a, a perfectoid affinoid. Okay. Um, but just as an example, certainly. Oh, and I didn't say what R was. R is merely R plus tensor QP. Yeah. So R, R, R plus is a subring of R. And, uh, so CP, OCP is certainly an, certainly an example of this. Okay. Um, so under these circumstances, once you have something in characteristic zero, then the Hodge theoretic objects have filtrations. So um, first example, so we have this map. Uh, no. There we go. That's R plus mod P to R. And so this is the map called theta. So familiar from piatic Hodge theory. Okay. Um, and let's let H0 over K be a P divisible group. And let's let H be a lift of it. Well, the right way to say would be a lift of the base change to R plus mod P. So H naught is over K, H naught base change to R plus mod P is over R plus mod P, and let's lift that to just to R plus. So now it's really in characteristic zero. <coughs> then, well, it makes sense to define the universal cover of H applied to just R plus. Okay. So it, again, it's this inverse limit under the p multiplication by p map of h applied to r plus. OK. Now, this should go in the middle. But I realize I can't really recover the back one. <laughs> Is the back one just stuck there forever? <laughs> I can't, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Suggestions, anyone? <laughs> you have to lower every, yeah. It's like a tower, the Tower of Hanoi problem. Just undo, okay. All right, so, um, So by what I just said, um, ah, right, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. So one little lemma is that when you take the universal cover of H and apply it to R, so you can just plus. You can, uh, of course, you get a reduction map like this. But this is an isomorphism. <coughs> so, uh, right. And I won't prove this, but it's really reminiscent of, uh, of various computations you do in Piatikach theory. So for instance, you can take OCP and map this to OCP mod P. That's a reduction map. And you take the inverse limit of this guy under Frobenius and the inverse limit of this guy. Uh, so this is just a monoid, but this is a ring. But this is an isomorphism, <laughs> right? So the proof follows exactly the same logic. And then, of course, this is one of the intermediate steps involved in the construction of the, pe the period ring. Yeah. So what we get as a result of this So we get a map from, 
does. So h tilde of r plus goes to h tilde naught of r plus mod p. But this is the same by, by the full faithfulness theorem as Dirne module of h0, tensor b Chris plus of r plus mod p. V equals p. And then I have this map theta, so I'll just apply it. So that's the map 1 tensor theta. And this now lands in m of h0 tensor r. So now I've, by doing this, I've certainly introduced denominators. So this map from h tilde of r plus to m of h0 tensor r. So um, this is I'll call the quasi-logarithm map. h is 0. So q log stands for quasi-logarithm. And I've labeled it by h0 because this map does not depend on the lift from h0 to h. Uh, yeah, yeah, OK. Um, I mean, of course, r, it depends on the lift r of r plus mod p, but uh, not on the lift h here. So, I, okay. so that's an important point. Um, I have an alternate uh, kind of interpretation of this quasi-logarithm map, which will be important. So I'll need some room for this, but I think I can fit it on this page. OK. So the other interpretation Quasi-logarithm, OK. So just remember what this Dudenay module was. So we have this lift h of h0 to r plus. And so it can be put in the center. So I can put it into an exact sequence like this. So, but I want to evaluate it on r plus. So OK. Uh, so this was the universal vector extension of h over r plus. Uh, here's the zero. Um, OK, I want to put another exact sequence above it. Uh, this will be the universal cover of H applied to R plus. And the map between them, so this is sets of, a set of p-compatible sequences of elements of this. And I just project onto the first one. The kernel of that is the set of sequences where the first element is 0. So the following elements are tor p torsion, then p squared torsion, and so forth. So that's just the Tate module. So I'll write just th of r plus 0. It's not guaranteed to be surjective. Um, and then there's a third row here. So from h of r plus, there's a logarithm, log h, which lands in the Lie algebra of h. But the logarithm introduces denominators. So now I really have to tensor with r. And then here's the Lie algebra of EH. But that's, by definition, the Giordane module of H0 tensored with r. And this map is the log that comes from EH. Uh, OK, 0. This thing I'll call fill 1, 0. All right, so here's this map from h tilde of r. So the fact that there exists, well, maybe I'll put a dotted line here. Well, dotted line here. Because it's not totally obvious that it exists. But I'll sketch a proof just orally. So this is an element, a sequence of elements of this guy, which are p-compatible. Lift them all haphazardly here. And now we have a sequence of elements here. They're not p-compatible. But you do this smoothing process involving a limit procedure, which is what you do over and over again in piatic Hodge theory. And then you get an element here, which really does lie above the element here that you started with. And this is actually going to be well-defined, because the ambiguity you get from lifting from here to here is measured by an element here. And that limit process involves multiplying by high powers of p. But since this is additive, that kills the element here. 
So there's my short oral proof of why there exists such a map here. OK, so this map exists, and this composition is the quasi-logarithm, h0. So it does not depend on the choice of lift. This whole center column doesn't depend on the choice of lift. It's just the filtrations that depend on the choice of lift. Okay. All right. Um, all right, so this will bring up, OK. Oh, I know. Yeah, yeah I'll actually do the thing I said I was going to do. So that goes up. I'll bring this up to bring the back one down. All right. I have to do it sometime. Mm -hmm. OK. All right. So. Uh, So this quasi-logarithm map, so it's um, defined whenever you have such a pair R, R plus. And so I mentioned something about attic spaces. Attic spaces are built out of um, attic affinoids of this form, spa R, R plus. So that's a set of continuous valuations on R, a valuation less than or equal to 1 on R plus. So I'm not going to go into a diversion on attic spaces, but I just want to mention that because of what we've just done, that is for every pair, we've constructed a map from h tilde of r plus to m of h naught tensor r. Um, what we do is we get um, a morphism. Well, it's like this. So h tilde is something like a formal scheme. But you can take its generic fiber, its attic generic fiber. And then once you've done that, then you can go ahead and apply this quasi-logarithm map coming from h0. And it lands in m of h0 tensor r. So that it's, I'll write it this way. You get a map to the additive group. Yeah. And well, it's, it's rather like this. I mean, I can even put this into a commutative square where I can project onto the first coordinate. So this is just h attic. Here's a logarithm map coming from h, and that lands in the Lie algebra. Yeah, tensor ga. So, OK. Um, so this is maybe this more classical thing. If h is, if h naught is connected, then this is a ball, an open ball if h0 is connected. So it's a map. I mean, it does what a logarithm should. It takes an open, it, it maps an open ball into the additive group. Yeah. OK. So, uh, so this, again, once again, does not depend on the choice of lift. Nothing here does. But then this does depend on the choice of lift. OK. OK. And one more little observation. So let's let um, n be the height of h0. And so originally this talk was about moduli of deformations of p divisible groups. So let's say one of those is given. That's our h. And now let's also add a level structure into the mix. So let's suppose that h is given together with a level structure. So what would that mean? That would mean a basis. So I want n basis vectors to be inside of, uh, so I let v h of r plus be a, be a basis. So this is the rational Tate module. And at most, it could be have dimension n. Well, I mean, assuming this is connected, so OK, has dimension n. So let's suppose you have a full level structure. OK. Um, then. So uh, you are starting, H0 is a very perfect field, and yes. R plus is related to some affinoid in the moduli space. What is R plus? So R plus is like a, yeah, so again, it's like our test object. So, um, oh, I, maybe it's underneath. So R, R plus is some given affinoid W of K algebra. And I'm saying, let's suppose we have a deformation of H naught to that test object together with a level structure. So this means that an R plus mod P, it is 
H naught or on R plus on one thing it is H naught? What was the question? So when you say deformation, yes, you have need a map from R plus to K no. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. So the right way to set things up is to have a map from, yeah. The right thing, I mean, I hadn't planned on going on to this, but somehow the right thing to do is to say uh, something like this, uh, P2, H. So really a deformation should be a pair, H rho, where this is a quasi-isogeny, together with an alpha. And an alpha is those n basis vectors. So a point of, of this moduli space at infinite level, valued in R, R plus, is really should be this kind of data. Okay. There's even a white lie there, too, but I uh, we'll, could tell you about it. So this, yeah, OK, OK. Really, you want to do these things locally on spa R, R plus. You really want to cover it. And then this might, I mean, in general, this might not be a bounded subring. Well, OK, there, there are various white lies in this discussion, but I can tell you about them later. So all right. So let's follow, let's, OK, so where do these alphas live? So they live in the Tate module, but maybe they have denominators. But if you follow them through this diagram here, they land in this filtration, which means that um, they can't really, so this thing is, is n-dimensional, but our n vectors in here can't span this n-dimensional space. They actually have to lie in this space of co-dimension, whatever the dimension of h is. So because of this diagram, so this guy has dimension d, where d is the dimension of h itself. Pull this up. And this guy has dimension n. And the observation I want to make is that uh, when you take quasi-logarithms, They lie in a subspace of co-dimension n, d. Mm. Dimension d, where d is the dimension of the original p-divisible group, okay. just by that diagram. Okay. All right, so now we're actually ready to define the moduli space at infinite level. So the deformation h disappears from the discussion. All that we have are elements alpha 1 through alpha n, and they are just some abstract elements floating in here, in the middle, in the part that doesn't depend on h. And the condition that we put on these n elements in here is exactly the condition I just wrote down. Their quasi-logarithms span a space of co-dimension d, rather than filling up this whole space of dimension n. There's n of them. Vectors, OK. All right, so, okay, put this here. Yeah. Okay. Mm. <coughs> so, all right. All right, so the idea now is to define a functor, which we'll call, I mean, so this is going to be the desired object, m h0 infinity. And it will take, OK, so it will be defined on such pairs <laughs> with the proviso that you know I'm telling a slight y lie, white lie about this. Yes? Right, so the correct, OK. So um, to define an attic space, that's, well, that's one of them. <laughs> um, right, so if I say that this is an affinoid w of k 1 over p algebra, then part of that definition is that R plus is integrally closed in R, and it's open and contains this bounded subring. Um, but I also want to assume that R plus is bounded. So uh, there, are, you know, there are these instances where R plus might not be. 
but it has to contain a bounded subring. So there are, the white lie has to rather to do with that. So, um, but glossing that over, this functor will take the following value on this. So, so I want it to be the set of, um, I'll do alphas, yeah. N tuples, which lie in H tilde of R plus. And by the way, even though I've written an H here, that doesn't mean that I've already lifted H0. Because I could have just as easily written H0 tilde of R plus mod P. Okay. Okay. So, um, or, or you could just say, pick any lift and form its universal cover, and then that's where these alphas live. Okay, so I want to impose some conditions here. Um, one of them is the condition I just wrote. So this lives in M of H0, tensored with R over W of K. These span a space of co-dimension D. So if you like, you get a matrix out of this guy. Um, actually, what I'll do is I'll put parentheses around here, and now it's an n-tuple of elements, so it lives there. and then. After having picked a basis for this guy, you get a, it's really n squared elements of R. And I want that matrix, that n by n matrix, to have rank n minus d over R. n minus d. Where remember, a, n is the height of h0 and d is the dimension. OK. Uh, this actually makes sense. So I mean, you want, certain minor, you want certain minors to vanish, and that makes sense in R. And then you want other minors not to vanish. So you want the ideal generated by those other minors to be the unit ideal. Okay. So that, yeah. Um, or you could just say, like, for every maximal ideal of R plus, of R, uh, it really is a matrix of rank n minus d. OK, I need actually one more condition, because for it to actually be a level structure, it, it should be in linearly independent. I mean. Yeah. Um, so it should be linearly independent inside of a vector space. Uh, I don't think it's good enough to just say that those things are, well, yeah, OK, that these are linearly independent on h tilde. I want to do it uh, point-wise. So I'll say it this way. For all x, uh, for all points of spa r r plus, maybe the residue field is like so, k, k plus. Um, when you take alpha and apply it to x, you get an element of h tilde of k plus. And this is a QP vector space, and I want these to, to be linearly independent. So they're linearly independent everywhere. So yes, yes, over QP, uh, yeah, exactly. They're QP linearly independent. So this, so H of K plus is a abelian group. H tilde of K plus is a QP vector space. H tilde of anything is a QP vector space. So I mean for them to be linearly independent over QP, just like if you were defining a modular curve X of P infinity, it should be like elliptic curves together with a QP basis for the rational tape module. Okay. So, all right, so then. Next main theorem. Okay. Uh, oh, no, I can, can I pull it all? Oh, yeah, I know, I know. Let's pull this down. So the next main theorem is just that this mh0 infinity does what we want it to do. Okay. But I have to be slightly vague about that. <laughs> so 
So M H zero infinity really does parameterize deformations of H zero with level structure. Um, so a deformation with level structure is one of these triples, H rho alpha over there. Yeah. And oh, okay, maybe that's just part one. Part two is slightly technical. So if you have an attic space, Schultz has a notion of one attic space being similar to an inverse limit of a tower of attic spaces. And this notion means a lot of things, but one of the consequences of it is that as a topological space, this is the inverse limit of these topological spaces. They're homeomorphic. And you also get an um, isomorphism, an equivalence of atoll sites. So for, as far as cohomology goes, this is really the limit of the cohomologies of these guys. And finally, well, yeah, I mean, you want this thing, I want to say something like this is a perfectoid space, but a perfectoid space requires a perfectoid field for it to be perfectoid over. But when you base change to some perfectoid field, you get a perfectoid space. What? For some, for, for any actually, yeah, yeah, for any. field K. And this last one, I mean, this is proved by first observing that the way that I've set this up, MH0 infinity lies inside of this space H tilde, well, n, n times, uh, generic fiber. Because a point of this guy is n elements of H tilde. So yes, at least it's a subset as far as functors go. But as a subspace, it's locally closed. <laughs> Why locally closed? Well, the conditions I've placed, well, the linear independence condition is an open condition. And the condition about the vanishing of those minors is a closed condition. So it's an intersection of an open and a closed. So it's a locally closed subspace of this space. And then the last thing you've got to observe is that when you take this space, and base change to some perfect, perfectoid field, this is really a perfectoid space. OK. Um, and so for instance, in just the case where H is connected, well, then H, H attic is just a ball. But then H tilde addict is something like a perfectoid ball. It's the inverse limit of balls under this atoll map, which corresponds to multiplication by P in the P divisible group. And that inverse limit has the structure of a perfectoid phase space. That's not, a hard, just, that's not hard to see. Okay. Uh, I go till half past, right? Yeah. Okay. So I planned a. I planned something like an explicit formula. So let's see how, f maybe I'll see how far I get here. So in the Lubin Tate case, hmm. so in the Lubin Tate case, hmm. so the dimension of H0 is 1. Uh, it's connected and has height n. And um, I want some matrix, which is an n by n matrix, to have rank n minus 1. And that just means the determinant vanishes. So as far as determinants go, what I can tell you is that the determinant map, which I'll notate as delta, even exists on the level of formal schemes. So I haven't passed the generic fiber yet. Um, to mu p infinity. Okay. <laughs> so there exists an alternating map um, such that uh, on when you pass to generic fibers, uh, well, you get this map. 
Here there's a logarithm. It's the usual logarithm. Here there's the quasi-logarithm applied n times. And so it lands in GA. The Lie algebra is one-dimensional, but there's n of them. Uh, but I'm uh, sorry, the geodetic module is n-dimensional, and there's n of them. So here's n squared. And then this is the determinant. So that's why I'm calling this thing a determinant. OK. OK. Um, yeah. Uh, all right. I'll go over here. And I even know what this quasi-logarithm is. Ah, not eta, delta. Oh, sorry. Oh, well, OK. Perhaps I'll just write some formulas. And if you have questions, you can ask me. So I don't know what to say after three minutes. But the quasi-logarithms are all known when you read the paper of Gross Hopkins. He computes the quasi-logarithms for h. And then you have to transfer them over to the universal cover. So h tilde, sorry, so h tilde as a formal scheme is actually w of k uh, double brackets t, 1 over p infinity. And the quasi-logarithm from h tilde to the student a module, which is like, oof. Uh, so I want n coordinates, because this is like ga to the n. So it sends t somewhere. It sends t, in fact, to g of t, g of t to the p, g of p to the n minus 1. And g of t is uh, so this wonderful formula appears in the paper of Fargan Fontaine. So, so some so i is in z, really over all integers, of t to the p to the n i divided by p to the i. There we go. Okay. So what I've written down is a power series that converges on the perfectoid open ball. Notice that it involves extracting arbitrary p roots of t. Okay. And then uh, <laughs> in order for this diagram to commute, uh, um, What's that? So i ranges over all integers, positive and negative. So for negative ones, you've got to extract piece roots. OK. So in order for this delta to really make sense, so, so basically uh, delta of x1 through xn, if x are, uh, these are my coordinates on h tilde to the n, um, this is something like exp of the determinant of g of xi to the p to the j. And uh, by an incredible miracle, this has no, this has no denominators. Where g is that power series, which certainly has denominators. If you believe this theorem and it follows from the full faithfulness result, you get this delta out of working with uh, period rings, then you have to, and you believe the commutativity of this diagram, then this delta is the exp of a log. So yeah, it's got to be true. OK. Um, okay. And then the Lubin-Tate space is defined somehow by um, it's defined by setting delta equal to a system of roots of unity. Yeah, that's all I'll say. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. Any question? Yes. yes. Uh, in the Greenfield case, you have a tower mm. which is not on this type with GLN. So does this theory work so far? Yes, yeah, so the question is about the Drinfeld Tower, yeah. which as I s doesn't actually fit into this paradigm. But that relates to the remark I made that you can adapt this construction to give you rapoport zinc space faces with EL structures. That's all you need for this. So the E is, means endomorphisms. And your endomorphisms could include an action of this division algebra. And so yes, the uh, Drinfeld space at infinite level works into this paradigm. And you actually get a proof of the isomorphism between the two towers this way.
You get a new group, uh, a different group? Yes, yes. I mean, it's, an, it's natural because both spaces now exist. So you, it actually says this thing that uh, they, there's a nice morphism between two spaces, two, two, two perfective spaces. It reduces to linear algebra. Yeah. Another question? Well, in the case yeah. uh, if you deal with uh, the P divisible group and at the end variety, you mm -hmm. have uh, other interpretations on the RAM community, uh, application of your quasi log, for example. So the question is about an abelian variety? Uh, and take the P divisible group and yes. the variety. So right. are there other interpretations? Of the quasi logarithm map. Yes, and the construction and the way you are also the so way of interpretation of the universal extension and right. so on. So, right. and uh, create a new cohomology H1 right. and so on. So, uh, so uh, I suppose, uh, and then, so uh, do you have further results in this case? Uh, no, no. So I think you're getting at. Um, is this quasi-logarithm map uh, compatible with other constructions that come from the fact that it's an abelian variety? Yes. Uh, no, I haven't thought about that. But. Of course. So you can smaller. Yeah, as Fontaine says, there, so the abelian varieties also fit into this universal vector extension oh, thing. So uh, then you have the multiplication and so on. Yes, yes. Oh, so you want to relate to this universal vector extension to the Hodge filtration of the H1 of the abelian variety. Yes, it must be compatible. Well, yes, of course, of course. It's, uh, uh, as as Jean-Marc says, it should be tautological. Yeah. <laughs> 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 OK, so any other uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so let's sum up. Speak again. Okay.